good evening, good morning, namaste. I'm very happy that I have an opportunity to talk to you about art and its importance in our everyday life. In 1978, we started the Cleveland Tyagaraja Festival in the basement of a small church with something like about 75 people attending. It was a small event. We could not afford to bring anybody from India for the evening concert. The schedule was something like have the Pancharatana singing at the beginning for about an hour or an hour and 20 minutes, followed by some interested people singing Tyagarajas Krithis then lunch, break for it, and uh, have an evening concert. We couldn't bring, afford to bring anybody from India at that time, so we said that, okay, we will uh, have somebody, some local talent, to give you a three-hour concert. And mind you, it was not, uh, it was great talent, even though it was local. Let's, we, have to, we have to admit that. So it started out with about 75 people in the basement of your church. One single day's program, one evening concert. Over the next about 46 years, this program has grown into more than 100 programs, about 5,000 people attend, and spans about 12 days. How did this growth occur? And what lesson is there as far as Europe is concerned if you want to start a festival like this over there? Number one, one of the things that we want to recognize is that in, in, in Cleveland's achievement, the Cleveland Chagaraja Festival's achievement, is that when you get 5,000 people in attendance, you got 500 people who wants to sing on the stage, the Pancharatanams. We found out that there was not a single auditorium that was available, not only in Cleveland, Ohio, but also in a 100 mile radius. So we ended up uh, renting a football stadium in which he set up a special stage to accommodate that many people. Stadium has a capacity of about 18,000 people. So accommodating 5,000 people was not a big event. Challenges like that are there. These are nice challenges to have in life. You start out something and it becomes big, much bigger than anybody has anticipated. What is the takeaway from that? Number one, more than 1,500 children participate in the Cleveland Tiagaraja Festival. These are people who have who come and give performances along with the greats of Carnatic music and Hindustani music, along with them. And there are children who participate in music competition, dance competition, group performances, and so on and so forth. But the most important thing is that from across the United States, from <clears throat> all over the United States and Canada, and sometimes from Australia, from Europe, and Far East and Middle East, people come to Cleveland to participate in that. What is it that has attracted all of them? What is it that has made this program such an eventful uh, program in Carnatic music history? Today, Cleveland Tyagaraja Festival is supposed to be, if not the largest festival, classical arts festival, Indian classical arts festival, let me be very specific. <laughs> than anything in, even in Chennai and so forth. That is done because of only one particular vision that the festival has got. And that is that, how do we make sure that young people are growing up in North America and in Canada, get motivated to learn this art form, put in the necessary effort so that they become fairly competent in that, get a degree of competence and acceptance in such a way that when Bhriju Maharaji, Padma Bhushan Awadi, Bhriju Maharaji comes and dances, along with him on the stage are dancers from North America, born and brought up there. When somebody like Dr. Yam Balamurli Krishna sings, along with him are youngsters born and brought up in North America. And they can go on like that. When <coughs> Kare Kudi Mari, the great Pradhanam Rajan came to Cleveland. He took five people and trained them so that you could play along with them on the center stage. Okay. That, how do you give that motivation to youngsters growing up in an environment in which you hardly hear Carnatic music, leave alone have people who appreciate it. 
We believe that in Cleveland, what we have done can be replicated anywhere else in the world, and Europe is no exception. Number one, we enroll, we enlist the help of the local teachers and the teachers and great gurus, acharyas, performers in India who are well established, who are legends by themselves. We enlist their help to take a large number of interested North American kids to learn from them, work with them, and come and perform with them on the stage. There's nothing more motivating for the young people than to be on the stage in a program that has got 100 programs, in a festival that has got 100 programs, in which you got the greats of the Carnatic music and Hindustani music and dance are performing, and along with them, on the same stage, you have an opportunity to perform. There's nothing more motivating than that. That's one thing that we have done. But, to mot but that's not the only sole motivation. If that's merely public adulation, a sense of satisfaction, that's not sufficient. As a youngster growing up in a, in a foreign environment, which is not like the environment in India, why should you learn it? What will motivate you to learn this art form? Most of you probably started learning this one because your parents wanted you to learn that one. They put you on a music school or a dance school. That's how you always taught, actually. And why is it that your parents wanted you to learn this art form? Number one, because they have a very rich under an understanding, a deep understanding of this rich cultural heritage. And they want to pass it on to you. It's something that defined them as who they are, and they want to give it to you. It doesn't take away your sense of being either an American or a European, okay? You are as much an American as you are an Indian, if you want to look at it that way. But this art form will tell you there's one part of your DNA that belongs to this cultural heritage. Don't lose sight of it. That's one of the motivation why your parents may give it to you. What do you get out of it? As you start learning this art form, however reluctantly you might, you will over time find that you start getting what I call an ethnic pride. Yes, I can relate to this music and dance. And this is awesome, is mind blowing. And I'm so happy that it's my heritage. That ethnic pride, a positive thing will come to you, number one. Number two, as you start getting into this art form, as you start putting in your time and effort in learning it, going to classes and so forth, you learn certain skills, you learn time management, because I know that most of you, most of the young children growing up in the Western world do exceedingly well academically also. And this helps them in terms of not only time management, but the ability to concentrate, the ability to focus, and the ability to more important handle something about which you don't know anything about to begin with. The ability to learn something totally alien is a very important trait that you need for the rest of your life as you embark on your academic career or you embark on your, your educational thing or you embark on your, on your career in the industry. You will be <coughs> facing with situation about which you did not know anything much, but you still have to master that. Learning an art form that appeared to be somewhat alien to you and mastering it gives you that particular skill that says that no matter what life throws at me, no matter what the industry throws at me, I can handle that. So you do very well academically because of your time management skills, your ability to focus, your ability to hone in and learn these difficult things, but it also stands in good stead for the rest of your career as in your life. So these are the things which will make you want to pursue this art form because it not only gives you a sense of satisfaction, a sense of peace within as you sing or dance, but it also prepares you to be better to handle the challenges that life throws at you. But is that all? Is that the only reason? No, I think it's going to be beyond that. 
you come for a festival. And there are, as I said, in Cleveland, you've got about 100 programs put together on 12 days. Start at 8 o'clock in the morning, goes non-stop until 11 in the night. Okay. You sit down and you participate in that. And you participate with your peers. And number one, you will notice is, where exactly do you stand in comparison with your peers? And the second thing that happens is that, as you perform and you get all the accolades and other things, you feel very happy about your achievement. The next concert you sit down and listen to is somebody, let's say, who is senior to you, either from your own neighborhood, your own part of the corner, or from India, that person might not come. And you start listening to the concert, or seeing the dance performance, and then you suddenly realize how far you have to go. Where exactly is the bar with somebody who is slightly senior to you? And that will motivate you to say, that's the next goal I want to reach. And then finally, in the evening, when you've got this major, major prime slot concert and other thing, you've got celebrated musicians and dancers that come and perform, you watch that, and then you realize the bar you saw earlier with somebody who is senior to you by three or four years is nothing compared to the bar you have to cross when you, saw, when you see those people perform. Is it an intimidating moment? Is it a moment in which you get dispirited? To some extent, yes. But what will also happen is that you look around and say that there are steps. The first step is that I want to be as good or better than somebody who is three or four years senior to me. And once I reach that, I'm going to aim for the next level. And that exactly is what you are going to do in your life also. When you start your college education, whether it's undergraduate or graduate or school, okay, you will find that concepts are very difficult to comprehend. You find out that theorems are very, very difficult to understand and then apply it. But as you learn that particular subject, you become more comfortable, more and more comfortable. Pretty soon, you are a master of that. Your music or dance education gives you an early start in that. Okay? You don't have to wait till you are 20 or 21 when you are going to the college to get that. But not only that, it builds you the fundamental, fundamentals that you need to feel self-confident that <clears throat> this I have handled, this alien art form to me, to this level of expertise, this level of competence, and I can handle this also. Science is different than art. In one way, yes. But in all, it's nothing but a human endeavor. It's nothing more than application of your brain power. It's nothing more than the ability to sit down, think about it, concentrate, focus on it, and then understand and master it. Music and dance will give it to you. The earlier you start, the better equipped you will be to handle the future. The future of not only your artistic pursuits, but, uh, but also your academic pursuits and your career goals, be it in music, dance, or in anything else. It can be in computers, it can be in medicine, it can be in engineering, it can be in accounting. It doesn't matter. It prepares you well for life. And more importantly, that as you embark on your career, be it in art, or be it outside the art. As you embark and as you see people who are quote unquote far superior than you, you'll also realize one more thing. That yes, at this particular point, that person is better than me. But I know I can reach that level. Because your earlier training in art has prepared you for this particular venture also. So music is there. Dance is there. It gives you life skills. Is there anything more than that? Yes. Something far, far more than that is also there. You can make money. You can lose money. You can have a nice house. Tomorrow you can lose the house because of economic condition. You can have a very, very good job. You may lose the job. You may even lose your friends. You may even lose your family. But I'll tell you one thing, art will never leave you, no matter what. Art is your faithful friend, your companion, 
for the rest of your life. Is that merely a cliche? Not give you an incident. The famed Mukta, uh, Brinda Mukta, legendary singer, was towards the end of the life. She was lying in bed, practically unconscious, not conscious of anything that's happening around. I went to visit her at that time. There are singers like Dr. Soumya and various other senior musicians who were there at her deathbed, so to say. And they said that, what is it we can do? They said there were some padams and javanis. So Saumya started leading the group, singing a particular javani, sang the pallavi, waited because forgot the anu pallavi, the groping for the words. Suddenly, Mukta, who was absolutely not conscious of anything that was happening around her until that moment, sat up in the bed and gave the lyrics for the next portion of that item and then just sang back into the bed. This is not a tall story. It was witnessed by people who today exist who can vouch for that one. That's the power of art. That's the power of music or dance. It will never leave you. Even when you lost control over all your other senses, in the heart of heart, the art form still is there. And you are one with it. That's what happens. And in, in Mukta's case, as I said, she was practically comatose. Had no sense of what was happening, yet one portion of her brain or heart or mind was listening to the music and was involved in that one to the extent that when the singers forgot the next line of the lyrics, she was able to articulate that. Is there anything more powerful than that I can say? I witnessed that personally, and people who witnessed it, like Saumya, are still around, they will still talk about it, and that's the power of art. And that's what God has given to us. And finally, do I have what it takes to take this art form? You will ask that question. Let me tell you something. Musical ability, or jnanam as we call it, is not the private property of a select few. God doesn't discriminate. Man may discriminate. God doesn't discriminate. He gives in each and every one of us the ability to learn music or dance, classical arts, and excel in it. There's no question about it. What it really takes is your understanding that you want to do this one. You need to get somebody who will bring the best out of you. You can take a big stone, which is somewhat bright. You give it a, a gem cutter, he will make a beautiful diamond out of that. Your talent may be camouflaged, may be hidden. Maybe you yourself did not even know you have it. But believe me, each and every one of us have the God's gift in us. All it takes is two things. Your determination to find that and your determination to find your guru who will bring that out of you. These are the only two combinations you need. There are enough gurus who will be very happy to teach you because gone are the days in which art was considered to be a private thing, to which you have to yearn your right to learn, etc. Today the gurus are eager to participate in this revolution that is taking place, the proliferation of singers and dancers. They want their legacy through their students, so they are very eager to give this art form to you. Do you have what it takes to realize that you, in your inner mind, in your heart, in your DNA, you do have the knowledge, the, 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 the jnana that is there. And all it is, is, is waiting for it, crying out to come out. Are you ready to give an expression to that yearnings inside you, whether you recognize it or not? You do that, you'll be amply rewarded. It is not in terms of the material success of being a professional artist or anything. We may not get out of the thousand people who pursue this art form at a young age, we may not have more than five or six people who become professional musicians. We may have another about 10, 15 people 
who are part-time professional, part-time in some other career. But the remaining 980 people out of the 1,000 people will become knowledgeable rasikas who appreciate good art. And what does it get you? It gives you an immense mental pleasure, a sense of peace that nobody can describe it to you. Absolutely it cannot be described. That has got to be experienced. And you want to experience that, to, which will make you a better human being, a better person, all of that. Then there's a need for an association, an organization, an event manager, whatever you want to call it, who will put together a program so that the people like you, the youngsters, will have an opportunity to not only pursue this art form, but have it validated that you have arranged somewhere, you have learned something, that validation has to take place. In a mega festival where you co-mingle with some of the greatest artists of our time, get inspired by that interaction, get inspired by their music, by their dance, by their art form, and say that, I'll be a better person, I'll be a better artist, and I can contribute better to the society. That is the primary goal of having a large festival. And that's the primary goal of having as many youngsters as possible to learn this art form and participate in that. Thank you very much for the opportunity you gave me. And I wish you all the success. And I wish the organizers the best of life. luck. Thank you.